You don't? The toxin like. My top three was one wasn't the rolling on the pole of the dogs. Really? <laughs>
Well, I know there's good lessons for life there. There's some things that are interesting historically there. And I know that somehow the sacrifice and this stuff is kind of leading up to Jesus, but it's confusing. It sounds too fantastic. It's uh, disturbing at times with the genocide and the slaughter and, and the treatment of women. And I just think I just prefer to stay in the Gospels and stay with Jesus. Anybody ever hear that or feel that at times when it comes to I hear that a lot as pastor. Um, but however, Jesus' own words himself, uh, about himself in the central message of the Old Testament are pointed and clear. So um, we've read part of one of these. Around your table, take a minute, look up those three passages. Jot a word or two down there around your table on, 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 on this, this issue. What is Jesus saying about himself as the central message of the Old Testament? How does Jesus interpret the Old Testament based on those verses? Ready? Go. There's a lot, we could, we could go deeper in this, but just, just a briefly feedback. We'll read these, these three passages, and there are certainly going to be more. What's the, somebody give us a, a gist of what's the gist of, uh, of how Jesus views the scriptures in relation to himself? And he said the scriptures speak of me, and he wasn't talking about the New Testament. Because it right, because it doesn't exist. Yeah, that's right. The law and prophets, the scriptures, you know, when he says to them, you are an heir, and which is, is it Matthew 22? It says, you are an heir. You know the they ask the question about marriage. And he says, you are an heir. Did you know the scriptures? And, and, and you don't know what they point to me. <clears throat> what does the John passage say to us in particular? People refuse to come to him. Yeah. yeah he, he's, he's chastised them really about their they study the law. The, the, you read the scriptures, and yet you, you miss the point entirely. And Luke, we just read about that. It gives us a sort of, I think, uh, Jesus hermeneutic, if you will, how he would interpret the Bible. And then Matthew 5. What is that, you know, that you know, the Steve Bowser was teaching on in, in a week or two weeks? <laughs> next week? This week? This, this Sunday? This Sunday, Sunday. Oh, yeah. yeah. So he, he comes to that, he says, do not think that I come to abolish them, but I come to fulfill them. He couldn't be clearer than that. But I've heard people say things like, he's in, Jesus in every verse. He's in every word, every verse of the Bible. I don't know, you read through his Proverbs. Some things, I'm not sure, you know, is he? But you read through some of the stories of, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, is he in every verse? If he is, how hard do we have to look? Is there some code book? And so what does it mean to point to Jesus in our teaching? I think that clearly we can assume from these three passages that taken as a whole, the Old Testament scriptures, he's the point. He's, they're all pointing to him as a whole. Was that? He's the focus. Yeah, he's the, he, he is the interpretive lens through which we should read them. But I've also, I see people fall off either side, right? Uh, and make the error on one side of what we'll get to later called moralism, where you make you make spiritual lessons out of the stories, and that's not the point. On the other hand, you miss Jesus. On the other hand, trying to squeeze Jesus out of a proverb that really isn't speaking anything about the Messiah, it's not messianic at all. You know, we can make errors on both ends. So anyway, how do we then how do we then teach Christ in our point to Christ in our teaching? You see, there simply put, the scriptures rightly interpreted. It is ultimately about Jesus as God, our Savior. Therefore, to greatly interpret it, you'll need to connect its verses, concepts, and events to Jesus. But how do we do this? Do we do this every, every single word or verse? Um, so we open to Colossians 3.16. Read that verse for us. He's bringing them along. 
But the point, I think, is he has to open their eyes. They need to have their eyes opened by someone else. It's easy as a teacher to think, yes, God opens their eyes. God has to open the eyes of the people, the hearts of the people that I'm teaching. I have to first turn it and say, with Colossians 3.16, God has to open our eyes to the scripture and see him in it before we're going to point to him. We have to see him there clearly. The word of Christ has to dwell in us richly as we teach and admonish. Um, you cannot point to Christ in your teaching unless you, you, you cannot find Christ, I think, in the scripture unless he's first found in your heart. It's not just an intellectual exercise, learning the, the methodology, if you will. Saul is a perfect example of it. Yeah. Knowing the scriptures in and out, memorized completely without the Holy Spirit, holding up the meaning of the words that he had memorized, who was being like that? He didn't know Christ. And so after his receiving Christ in his life and going off by himself and the Holy Spirit working on him, all these connections started coming together. And then when he came back and he started going to the synagogues, they couldn't compete with him. Right. Because it was he had, he had this he had the, the, the base knowledge, add to that the spiritual enlightenment. I, I've, I've often wondered if the scales fall from his eyes were symbol, symbolic of that very thing that now he sees. And, and this one isn't the, the not deal with two of the perimeters, right? But That's right. I mean, that wasn't a big part of the purpose of this teaching that these two men went back to find the coward apostles. And their eyes were open because they related to them, we didn't understand until yeah. they broke the bread. And then they knew what that Last Supper had been. Then weren't were not their eyes open because of this testimony that they received. Right. And, the, the, and their going right. back was that the, the very point to which he opened their eyes. So is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Right. That it wasn't, I mean, I don't want to get um, too far afield. So, I mean, the teaching of that event was, I think, as much for the disciples to be able to, yeah. to think as that it was a testimony. If they had known from the very beginning that came and we saw Jesus, we talked to him, all this, yeah. how would the disciples perceive it? But if they said, yeah. he explained all this to us, but we didn't understand, then he broke the bread. Right. And, 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 then, and then it's upon reflection, I think that's the, yeah, they're getting it the was point. A, right. It's upon reflection of the walk on the road as he explained this to them, that they talk about their hearts burning within right. them. Just like the Paul experience. Yeah. It's, they had all that, but they needed something they didn't to see. understand. Right. Yeah, we're, you're, we're getting deep into it, which is good. Where we're going. Sorry. Uh, no, it's good, very good. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> we'll come back to that part. Um, Jenny, this, and I think we should send this link out, sent to me a, shared a link with me to a, how do you say his last name? Tully and Tavijin? Tavijin. Uh, I can't spell it, but I can barely say it. Um, really, really, a, really a, it's, it's called the, the Hero of the Bible, I think, right? The, the, and uh, he's teaching from the Man's Road story about Christ as the hero of the story. It's an intro message to a series he's giving. <coughs> but in that, he, makes, he has a quote, 99% um, of people in American churches tend to, uh, today read the Bible as if it were a god sent self-help manual. I think he's exactly right. We, you would, if, if you make that statement, people would reject that and say, no, no, I don't. But that's how, and, and I think a lot of people that are in our ALCs and in C groups in our church approach it that way. I've got a problem with my marriage, what was the Bible, what can I find in here? My kids struggle in school, how can I encourage them in scripture? Um, you know, I, I need, I'm, I'm feeling depressed, or, or so I have, my, my sister-in-law is, is down, and, and what can I send to her to help her out? I'm not saying all these are, this, this is necessarily wrong, or you shouldn't ever look for a scripture for, it, for insight, for inspiration, for encouragement. But I think that's the primary and even only way most people in our church and the Church of America approach the Bible. As if it's a good, kind of a heaven, divinely inspired self-help manual. It's got good for what ails you, you know, whatever, whatever it is you're facing. And, and, but we never get to what really ails us. And the real answer, it's more like inspiring words for those who have issues. Um, so I think the central idea that we have to convey as teachers is this. Um, and, and this should come through in, in direct and confrontational ways, in gentle and subtle ways, in um, kind of roundabout ways, but it should be a, it should be a theme in our teaching. When we, when we teach from the scripture, the central message should be, you are not the hero of the story, you are not the center of the Bible, the Bible is not primarily about you. Because everything in our culture is conditioning us to think that it's about us. That the world is about us, that our lives are about us. 
It runs completely contrary to the way that we're conditioned subconsciously to think. Apps on your phone. I just got a new iPhone 6. My wife went and waited in line. She read about it. She was all excited about it for a new phone. She had the traded value for a free phone. She said, we're doing this. I'm like, oh, it doesn't matter. She went at 4.45 <laughs> to the Verizon store in the morning. I brought her coffee and omelet at 6. And the store opened at 8. And she was number 8 in line. It was hilarious. We, it was like a fun thing for us. And so we got our, got our phones, you know. But the whole point is now it's, it, it, it makes you like more convenient. The guy was I'm like, you don't have to sell us. We've been here since 4 5 in the morning. We're going to give us the phone. We're going to give us all the stuff we can do, you know. But our, our role is, it's, it's, it's just in the water, we're all swimming in. This is, it's about you, it's about you, it's about you. Even the way you read, we're taught to read text, to digest it for information, spit it back for a test, get what you need to know out of it, you know. Um, and then, um, in fact, it's not new though. I think it's in the human condition. I didn't quite see this this way before. Back in the Luke passage for a minute. Luke 24, verse 21. <clears throat> So they're, so they're talking about what's going on. I, I think it's interesting. Jesus, after being uh, away for three days, comes back. The first thing he does is engage somebody in conversation about what's going on and help them eventually see who he is. And then he says, you know, they, they stop. They look sad. And he goes, what's wrong? And they go, have you not heard? You're the only person on the planet who doesn't know what's going on around here? And then he's like, what things? He's, he's totally messing with them. You know, like, he, what things are you talking about? And they say, well, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, the guy who's done all these amazing things. And, well, we thought, in verse 21, we hoped that he is the one. That he was the one to read in Israel. And to make matters worse, crazy women are talking about stuff that happened, and nobody knows what to do, but clearly he's not the one. And I thought about this this way. They were, they were interpreting what they knew in their experience through their own desires, their own needs. Now, he was and is the one, but not the way they saw it, right? We thought he was the one that was going to redeem Israel, restore the glory of Israel, overthrow Rome, put, put us back in our rightful place as God's people, but it can't be. You know, I just, it struck me that, in a way, the first century way, they're doing the very same thing. They're coming to what they know and to the, the prophecies as it has to be this. It has to be the fulfillment of our desires the way we're thinking about it. <coughs> yeah, right. I think it's perhaps we live in a world that's maybe accelerated that and, and, and fed into that, that human uh, tendency uh, more than any other time in history, but it's certainly not new, right? Um, but Jesus essentially says to them, What? It's this story's not about you and your needs and your desires. It's about me. This, what you, what you learned since you were a child, what you've experienced, these scriptures, they have never been about you primarily. You're in there, of course, but you're never going to see you until you see me first. <clears throat> so, what about the Puritans, Puritan reformers to say sin is the human being curved in, the human heart curved in on itself, you know, to see it through our own lenses. Uh, so I think one thing is, to point, one way we point to Jesus is, is first, by beginning with the foundational message, that it's not, the Bible is not about you, you can't, how not to approach the Bible. So um, a couple of questions we should always be asking, implicitly and explicitly in our teaching. <clears throat> Or what does this text teach me about God? And what does this text teach me about the promised Messiah or about the Christ? How, how many of you have ever been in a group where you read a passage of scripture and the first the first launching point for discussion was, well I think this means you ever been in a group of people who start that way? Well to me this means level two is a great reason we go to high school ministries. Or uh, I, you know, I think we just begin with our opinion, our felt need, our desire, what we you know, what we draw and pick, and pick uh, from the smorgasbord of spirituality, that we pick and choose what we think it means. And I think that's rampant in groups. So as teachers, we're teaching people not just how to see Christ, but first how not to read the Bible as well. You don't approach it that way. Fundamentally, that's not to say. Like I can remember lessons as a kid. And I think to to Vigil, ch, 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 what is it? Chivin? Chivin. <laughs> talks about this. Uh, how many of you were in a Sunday school class where David Blythe was ever taught? The flat graph, <laughs> right? And, you know, I, I, I like flat graphs. I think they're cool. But what was the 
the, the message of the, of the story for most, you know, most of the classes. With God's help, you can. Yeah, who are the giants in your life? I'm afraid of not being popular. I have this issue. This is giants, right? We make these things giants, you know. We, there's even a movie called Face Human Giant. It's a football movie, it's very cheesy. Got a two hour and a half movie. It's all perfectly wrapped up and, and wonderful at the end. Um, which, in my experience, is not real life, but anyway, maybe your life is different. <laughs> you know, so, and, and, I'm, and certainly there is strength and encouragement, and God does seem to love the underdog, and there are moral lessons we can draw from passages, and it's not wrong to point them out, but that's not the, that's not the way you approach the Bible. That's not the way we are to teach the Bible. That's not the fundamental message of that text, you know. Uh, so, we're off the outline here, let's get back. So, let's talk about some of the ways that we find Jesus in the scriptures. Um, first one, prophecies. We won't belabor this point because you no doubt have books on your shelf or can do your own searches on the great sites that are there. There's no shortage of this. But what's the very first Messianic prophecy in the Bible? Anybody know? Genesis 3. Yep, Genesis 3.15. What, what is it? Important if they remain in the list. He will bruise your people. Right. He will bruise you. And so what's the, what's the, how is that messianic? What's that pointing to? You will crush his head by his right here, right? Speaking to the man who brought the serpent. He's going to be the old cow or he's going to over evil. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure that, um, you know, the Passion of the Christ movie, which when I first saw that, I, I, there's some things in there that I wondered about, and Gibson seems to have a, his movies always seem to be very bloody, including especially that one. But he, I think he got a scene in there that's beautifully put uh, in the garden when when Jesus is praying to overcome his you know his praying for strength to finish his mission and there's that that hideous kind of kind of androgynous weird looking uh, satanic character and the snake comes out from his robe. Do you remember this scene? And after the, after that that uh, that scene is over, he gets up and his foot comes out, it scares you. Boom! Put the sandal comes down. Question the snake's head. I think that I, I wonder if he put it in a little too early. There should have been another resurrection. But anyway, the point's made, right? Because yeah. the very first messianic prophecy comes in the very first book of the Bible, so and they're they're there throughout. So when we come to the prophets, if you're teaching the prophets, or if you're coming across passages that refer to the prophets, you can't miss that. You can't fail to draw attention to that. I mean, you should not. We can. Sometimes we do. Um, 1 Peter uh, 10, 1, 10 through 12. Um, 
the Bible is utterly unique on, on, in, on this issue. Second, Christophanes, it's a fun word, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-A-N-I-E-S, Christophanes. I need a mark for it. We have a new version of all that. Uh, it is? Yeah. <laughs> That's called the but I changed it to Christophanes for the, to make, put a fire on it. Which I didn't change it. That's also a word. I'm not inventing words. Uh, the point is that the, the Lordship of Jesus Christ does not begin with resurrection and ascension. That he has always been Lord. I think sometimes that's a mistake I hear, or we don't, we don't make that point clear enough. The resurrection and ascension makes explicit what's, been, what's implicit all throughout Scripture. You know, his, his, his conquering of, of, of the grave and his ascension to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, we know that's, that's like just putting an exclamation point on what's been there all along. Um, who knows what a Christophany or a Theophany is? Give us a working definition. Laura. It's an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ. Yeah. He shows up before he shows up in the flesh. Um, How does that work? Right. Some people wonder, well, does that mean he was, in, was it, uh, are, they, are they visions? Are they apparitions? Are they, is he not actually in the flesh? Is some other body? You know? He comes in angelic form when Jacob wrestled with the Right, right. So, but I, I think the, one, just, uh, this is probably not a distinction without a difference, but wondering, what was he? Form did he take? You know, I don't know. Well, flesh? No. Angels don't have wings. wings. Right. Uh, so, uh, for example, in, in Well, the cherubim do. The seraphim do. They're well, different creatures. I'm talking about the cherubim. Yeah, the cherubim. Right. But angels appear as... Human beings. Human beings. Right. Uh, but the whole point I'm trying to make is I, I, he clearly appears as a man, as a human being. But the incarnation is unique in history that he, in, he inhabits flesh. So prior to that, he's taken on the form of flesh without inhabiting it the way he does in the incarnation. This is probably, you know, just spinning our wheels in interesting ways, but. Um, that seems to well, be part of his personage, so. Yeah. I mean, because he is kind of one on one contact with. All through, all through history. Um, so that almost seems like that's kind of part of his person. What is? Sorry, Steve. That that, that human one-on-one -on -one contact that he has. Because I, I always heard it earlier on when I was little that those were always angels. Those were angels. That that wasn't. And it was yeah. only later when I really started to study, study scripture that it was. No, this is this is pre-incarnate Christ. Yeah. One of the distinctions, oh, sorry. But it just seems like it's it, it it's his person. It's not the Holy Spirit that does that. Right. It's not it's not the Father that does that. It's always Christ. So it seems like it's part of this, right. the 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 second person of the Trinity. That's the role. He's the most of, personal. Yeah. In, in terms of his, his, his relating to human beings that way. Right. Yeah. The, and I think that's true because it, one of the distinctions is in the Old Testament angels are always identified as such. Right. You're not you're not left wondering. In the scripture, whether or not there's an angel, we give either a name or we call an angel. There's other appearances of what appears to be angelic form, deity, and that might be true till the end. Uh, and those are appearances of the second person of the Trinity, the pre incarnate Christ. Um, you, you know, when he's walking with Abraham, wrestling with Jacob, that's my favorite story in the Old Testament, the wrestling match with Jacob. I think that's, it's, you know, probably that for, for all of our lives, certainly it's for mine. And then he gets just like up to your hand, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I've often used the, the analogy of wrestling with my boys exactly. when they were young. You know, I, I, would, I would let them feel like they're winning for a while, but I had to hold back. They could never bear the full weight of dad because I would crush them. <laughs> so, so, so I had to withhold some of my weight. They could never possibly bear the full weight because it would destroy them. But I would let them, I would feel like you're doing well, so and then I would whack them down, you know, when they'd giggle and that, you know. All the while, but every now and then we got a hand, and I would unintentionally, like, well, they go, whoa, you know, don't mess with that, you know. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an analogous picture there that, that touch symbolized something. The gentleness of, of God in that encounter. He's not, there's only one in history who could bear the full weight of God, of the Father, and that's Jesus. And he did that, took the full weight, and it did crush him for our iniquities, as Isaiah says. 
anyway, it's, it's a beautiful it's story. It's really interesting to study Jesus in the form of man as well as you know, his deity and see the differences because yeah. there's a verse that says, even the Son of Man does not know the hour of the day when he will come. Yeah. Okay, well, how could Christ not know? Right. And it was because his divinity chose not to reveal that mm -hmm. to his man. It's easy to say, hard to understand. It's <laughs> well, clearly. What? what? You know, why did you go? Was he going, no, 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 don't tell me. <laughs> because he had to be totally man to be able to overcome the sin. Yeah. If he let his. You know, that. that, that, that do that. I'll be honest with you, that, that particular one, I don't want to get too far on the subject, but that particular one's a mystery to me. I, rest, I struggle with that because there's a, there's a, there's a not so distant heresy about God limiting his own knowledge. Because people can't reconcile foreknowledge with predestination. And so they say, well, God just, just, God just blocks his mind. And that's what you're saying, I think, is probably the closest we can come to putting into words. But it feels like it comes dangerously close to, like, you know, <laughs> God doesn't cease to be God. No. So anyway, it's tough. I, I'm not sure I can reconcile that perfectly. But that's it. Sorry for a different teacher's training. Wow. No, but it, it is. These are the things, you know, that, and these are the things that, that may come up when you present this. We only know what we know. There are, certain, there are certain mysteries that I don't know that it was possible for us to fully reconcile. But in the context of a Jewish wedding, that does have significance. Because when the bridegroom went home to build the house or the room that he and his bride were going to occupy, he didn't return for his bride until his father said, it's time for you to go and get her. So he doesn't know when his father would say that? Is that the context in which that? What? Is that the context in which that reference to the New Testament is made in the context of the wedding? Right. And he says the son man is not I'll tell wedding. you, Zolmada is the key resource <coughs> in terms of the Jewish wedding and its application to, to scripture. Right. Um, and in end time, in end time events, it's highly significant. Yeah. I'm trying to remember, and I'll have to look it up, if, if, if the wedding context in which Jesus says the Son of Man does not know the hour. No, no, no because his disciples pressed him with the yeah. question when he started talking about uh, the destruction of the temple. Right. And, you know, when are all these things going to happen? And he said, it's not, it's, uh, it's not for me to say. Yeah. Um, Edmund Clowney wrote a book called uh, Preaching Christ in All Scripture. Uh, introduction is beautifully written, uh, just about how we should approach the Bible this way. And then he basically, chapter by chapter, goes through some major Old Testament themes and, and really unpacks them and, and, and thoroughly on how they point to Christ. It's so worth getting if you don't have it. He writes, uh, he doesn't write, this is his, his search, I should say, arguments. The central affirmation of New Testament writers is that the pre existence of Jesus was present in the history of the Old Testament. It's therefore not a question of tracing out of uh, types, you know, we'll get to typology in a minute, types of Christ or images, but rather tracing the activity of Christ himself. So that's an important distinction, I think. It's not like, we're not on a, 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 a biblical where's Waldo trip, looking for little types that we can draw out and, and maybe force the text to say these are the same. What we're doing is tracing out the activity of Jesus because he's always been there. So we're not trying to find him. Does that make sense, the difference? Um, the same Jesus at work in creation and in the midst of miracles and so forth. That's John 1. Flip <clears throat> uh, the page. Types. Typologies or types. How many of you, uh, Keith, you're, you're, you're in, uh, what's the class you're taking right now? DG Transformation. Okay, so probably not going to get into the Old Testament typology of Christ, but uh, I hope it's a great class. Okay. Um, how many of you have uh, ever, ever heard of or talked about types of Christ in the Old Testament? Have you ever heard that phrase used before? Um, I'll give you a little, little definition here. There's different ways to think about it. Types are um, figures, institutions, or events that foreshadow Jesus in some way. I would go further, and I should have gone further. I thought about it since I typed out the, speaking of types, no problem, the outline. Uh, that they would, I would say that, that find their truest fulfillment in the incarnate life of Christ. Old Testament events, figures, um, circumstances, institution that find their ultimate fulfillment in the New Testament incarnation of Jesus Christ. That's a type. So the type doesn't have to be a person. The tabernacle is a type. 
in that sense. Uh, uh, Sinai is a type. The, the event of the sacrifice of Isaac, or near the sacrifice of Isaac, is a type. So types are not necessarily just individuals there. They can be occurrences or institutions and so forth. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going to go get the market board and bring it in because I need it for this next part. While I do that, we've got some examples here. Um, on number six, many others such as uh, the true bread, the true vine, the true light. What else? Remember, these, these, would be, these would be Old Testament types, so not just, not just images of the New Testament, but those would be shepherd. Shepherd, absolutely. The gate. The gate. Melchizedek. Melchizedek, yeah. Shows up in when Benjamin Hebrews, yep. Bridegroom, who's already mentioned. Living water. Uh, Lamb of God, I heard you mention. Well, yeah, Boaz would be a type, the yeah. kinsman redeemer, um, but um, it, it's not, a, not an image, per yeah. se, it's an actual person, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this is, uh, sorry, go ahead. But this is Old Testament, but the serpent on the stick. And wilderness. Yeah. And the broad serpent. Raised up. Tristan. So I'm going to draw this diagram. You can draw, you can draw it on your notes there, Bob, if you like. Um, this is taken from, uh, somewhat adapted from Farley's book, that he's actually citing. Um, forgot to do that one. that. So you have Old Testament uh, truth. Um, here the, the history. Redemption and Revelation. Revelation and Redemption finds its fulfillment in Christ. That, that has a particular kind of significance or meaning my marker is losing it um, and then that, that, that brings us to our teaching or preaching um, I miss this stuff here, Old Testament event, the actual event itself, I see that. The event Because an event is a truth, and we we moralize that. 
that into a spiritual lesson. Don't be David, don't be Goliath, be David. Kind of stuff, you know. Don't be Saul, be David. Um, and or, or moralize lessons that, that, that I we already did it by example. Or they go this way. And this is allegory. Now there's a good there's a, I think there's a, there's a a place for allegory, but if you read the early church fathers, they had a real love for it. And went crazy with allegory. Uh, to the point where I think they, they twisted the text all out of their shape and meaning. And sometimes that happens as well. We allegorize things, things that they really aren't types of Christ. We make them into things that are not meant to symbolize. I, I thought this helped, maybe that's confusing, but that's helpful to me. Old Testament events, there's a symbolism that points to the truth. The history of Revelation redemption reveals the fulfillment in Christ. There are types when we know this story, we can go right from here to there because we see it, we're saturated in it. But these are the two steps, these are the two places we don't go. We don't go from the truth or the event straight to our teaching, in other words. We've got to get the fulfillment in Christ. You know, it's the, that's the problem with the green lines, is they're not coming from this, they're not coming from this point to our teaching. That's, this is the line that has to happen. It was helpful to me anyway, and that's that I agree. And I read that and came across that and thought about that um, too late to put it in your outline. So, you know, because I would have drawn another computer for you, or had anything. So, so Jeff, is it always wrong to go down the green line of moralism? Good question. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I guess I could teach on the Ten Commandments and say, you shouldn't lie. And right, which is true, you shouldn't lie. Which is true, you shouldn't lie. Yeah. And did I go down the wrong path that I start going down the green line? Yeah, that's a great question. What did, let's, let's have a discussion about that. Yes. Yes, it's always wrong? Yes, it's, it's wrong. And the reason is, is because Jesus and the gospel are at the center of why we're doing what we're doing. And so many people, I've got, in my mind, I've got something kind of like that, but it's much simpler. Uh, simpler. So I hear people teaching at that level, and it's like they went a foot down into the ground. And I call it kind of leaving it hanging in midair, you know, I'm using the ground as But they miss the root that it always goes back to right. the gospel. And so it becomes something that I think they can live at a human level and please Jesus by doing that. Right. That was very well said for a simple man, Mark. I'm glad we reported that. It was very well said. I, I would say, so I would answer your question by saying no and yes. I think, no, it's not wrong to say that you, thou shalt not lie. The scripture says thou shalt not lie. Why does it say that? Where does that come from? What's behind that? And where does that point in ultimately? Where does it begin? What's that? Where does it lead? Yeah. If we're all going to lie. Right. If we're all going to lie, then we're all condemned. Right. 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 So, so while, while that particular commandment in and of itself, this is where we get to the point where people say, Christ in every verse. Well, if you understand the sweep of narrative redemptive history, yes, in a sense, but not every phrase or every verse actually directly points to him. You have to know that. And you have to be, so I would say the gospel undergirds every verse. You know? Anyway. No, it's good because this whole time I've been thinking I was going way at the end and say you can get, I hate to say the word narrow about Christ, but I mean you can kind of look for Christ in the Old Testament but it's not far off to say find the gospel so you find right. sin there and yes. it's just a very small step from sin to Jesus. Now it is the gospel. So <laughs> gospel, yeah. I tend to think of looking more for the gospel in the Old Testament than just Jesus. Yeah. Well, if we find Jesus and we don't want to talk about the gospel, then that's another kind of failure. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. True. There's Jesus. Well, I think there's Waldo. What, for what purpose are we talking about? <laughs> right? What is the significance we should be? And I, I think sometimes, I don't know if you fall in this trap, when you spend enough time as a teacher in the scriptures and studying these things and reading these things, you make assumptions about your people. That, oh, they, they know that. But you make, you make leaps that they haven't made in their hearts or in their head. And I'm, I'm still relearning this. I want to caution you, don't do that. Assume nothing about the, uh, their ability to connect the dots in their own heart and their own lives. If, if it might feel elementary to you because you've been in a class or you've heard someone preach it or you've read five books on it or you've looked it up on the internet and it's come up on 16 sites, you know, that you, 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 you don't assume that they've done that or, they just, or that even if they have, they get it. Anyway, other thoughts on that? So, yeah, yeah, Jeff, I'd like to answer. I'm actually, I'll give you a little background on my story. There's a gentleman that I know who's struggling in his life, and I'm, he's Catholic, 
and he's very afraid to talk about this. Mm. And when you ask the question about uh, is it wrong to go the moralism around, my first thought was no, because if I, if I get to the Christ story too quickly with him, I'm going to scare him away. Because yeah. I've been down the path a little bit and he got very nervous. Yeah. Uh, so I've actually backed up on that message for now. Yeah. And I just recently got in the case for Christ. Because I've been trying to work on him. You didn't get him a taste for moral living, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> but I've also been working on it for a little while. Yeah. I think his heart's now ready to on that path. So I start with my story. You know, well, that, Kurt, that's a, I'm glad you brought that up, because there probably is a distinction in teaching the scriptures and in, in personal evangelism mm -hmm. what we need to make there. Yeah, We're teaching the, 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 the message of the scriptures. You're trying to reach your friend to gain an audience. There, there, there's nuance there that yeah, I think is absolutely. exactly the same. Absolutely. Yeah, there's another reason why you can't miss that top part. It's because it's no use to you or the people you teach when they're in the pressure situation and they're tempted to lie. You, you shouldn't lie because it's wrong. It's just not very powerful an antidote to the right. temptation of right. sin. But yeah. knowing why you don't do it because God is like that. That, that's much more powerful. Right. For that phrase that you hear a lot these days, preach the gospel to yourself. It's not preach rights and wrongs to yourself. It's right. preach the gospel to yourself. I, I've used this countless times because it's been so forward for me. Jonathan Edwards' book, The Nature of True Virtue. And he unpacks what's behind human efforts to live righteously. It's fear and pride. When you dig deep enough behind all human effort to live right, you find fear and pride. And he, he talks about and John Lennon was Puritan in a brilliant way, which I'm horribly reducing right now, you know. He talks about parenting. You probably heard me talk about this. That when you, you've heard the parents say things like, wait till your father gets home, if you step out of line. What is that? Harboring fear. Or we're afraid you shouldn't act like that. Pride. Do this because you're better than that. You know, well, the gospel says actually you're not. You know, you can be. Through Christ, but you are not. I said that. I said that on Sunday in the sermon here at the East Campus, you know. Because Peter in the sermon in Acts 2, 14 to 41, three times he said, This Jesus who you crucified. Now he's taking a secret friendly message, you know. You did it, you put to death, and you killed him. And uh, it, it, we need to be told that. Part of the gospel. Anyway, but getting back to this, I, you can't go here even unless you've spent the time studying, reading. Go that way. Unless you understand this trajectory, this is just an academic exercise. You can learn the tricks or memorize the types, but that doesn't happen. You have to be able this, this, but not only because of this. Right? This is a, this structure all together. Uh, okay, enough about the diagram. We move on. Any other thoughts? Or any other point you want to challenge? That, please. I just want to make a comment uh, on the history of Revelation. There's a book uh, called The Master Theme of the Bible by Jason Bill Baxter. Jason Bill Baxter. Yes, which traces Christ from Genesis to Revelation, and I found it very helpful. Yeah. You can but check that song from 15 years ago. Oh, well, yeah. Exodus eats the same. Yeah. yeah. I think I, there's like a poem, I think I even recited that one time in a, in a sermon, yeah. or a truncated version of it, because I couldn't memorize it all. It's easier to memorize this. Is that? It's easier to memorize this. Yeah. Uh, so, one, one, on types for a minute, one um, school of thought is that, okay, what, how, when does typology become allegory? Or when do we get off and we create the types that aren't there? Because you can twist up out of shape and find some Jesus connection and, and things that, and, uh, and I see that happen. Uh, one school of thought is that you should, we should only recognize those types that are identified in the New Testament as such. Sometimes they show up. One example is Jesus says, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the earth three days and three nights. Right? Well, that's the sign of Jonah he talks about. It's a type. We don't, and we might miss that if Jesus didn't point out to us, quite frankly. It's not when we read the story of Jonah outside of Jesus' own comments, you necessarily go, oh yeah, look at the resurrection. You know, you don't, you don't automatically get that. So there are some types that are pointed out to us in the New Testament. I, I think, though, I think you can find, um, that's a little bit like saying you can only find, you, only, you can only use the types that the New Testament identifies as types. 
It's a little bit like saying you can only find the answer to the math problem by looking at the back of the book. It sort of skips over doing the work of finding them, you know? So I do think there is a process. It doesn't just go to the New Testament and, and just list them out. There is a process for us of study and, and, and of reflection and meditation that, we, that allows us to see more and more where Christ is in, in those types of typologies. Is that? Okay, move on. Next page. Um, this is Jesus, the true and better, and, the, and what you put there is dot, dot, dot. The true and better, all these things listed. Um, you can probably Google this, or I'm sure, I'm sure you can uh, podcast or find it. Tim Keller, I don't remember the name of the sermon. Jenny, remind me, we'll look it up and find it. He gave a great sermon, a serious sermon on this, to use the true and better um, uh, all the Old Testament characters. So when you read about these great biblical figures as listed here, uh, we're not, the, the point as teachers is we're not to approach them immediately as lessons about good and bad to follow or to avoid. That's what the slippery slope to moralism. I think that happens a lot, right? Here's an example of what to do, here's an example of what not to do. That's, that's not the primary reason these characters are given to us in Scripture. And I think that's, it's unbelievably common in children's curriculum, in Sunday school curriculum, and in adult lessons as well. Um, we might find these examples. It's not wrong to find examples and to point out lessons about life from these characters. But here's my point. You don't need the Bible to have lessons to follow and to avoid. That's what the Bible's given to us for. You don't need the Bible to get a whole long list of people to emulate and to not, and to, and to not emulate and to, and to avoid actively, right? We, we, life is full of that. History is full of that. Biographies are full of that. The news is full of that. The Bible is unique in that it's not giving us a list, a list of people that we should, oh, this is a hero, this is a villain, this is somebody who got a right, somebody who got it wrong. That's not what we're given here. We're given what? We'll go back to Jesus' own teaching. What is it? The Bible's, the point of the Bible, listening to this character, is not to give us lessons to avoid or to follow. It's what? To point to Christ. That's what it's for. That's what the book is for. So we go down the list here. Uh, in fact, put above Abel, I don't know how I missed this, Adam, is that being there? Actually, put it, if we were alphabetical, we're going, we're going chronological, sort of. Um, and this, I want you to find your tables. Do you know what I Okay. <laughs> That's what you think. <laughs> um, so, around your tables, uh, let, let's, let's, um, one, two, three, four, five. You take the first four, Abel, Adam, Abraham, Isaac. You take over here, uh, John, Joseph, Moses, Job, and David. And you guys just get three. Joe and Boaz, Nehemiah. And how, is, how, in what sense is Jesus the true and better version of that character? I know that's probably requires more explanation, but let's see what it means. We lost Laura. Um, how is Jesus the true and better Adam? And the, by the way, this would be a great ser sermon series, and someday I will preach it. Um, maybe just to be all of you on it, teacher, teacher, teachers, time. But um, how is Jesus the true and better Adam? Is that your table? <laughs> Well, five, Paul, five, Paul, five, tells, Paul tells in Romans 5, right? Romans uh, 5 and uh, 5. I've sinned into the world through one man, so grace enters through the sacrifice. One man's disobedience leads to death, one man's obedience leads to life. There's this contrast back and forth. Jesus is the true and better Adam. He's the first born of all creation. Adam is the first created man. Jesus is the, is the perfect man. Adam is the most imputed to us, but Christ. Righteousness is given to us. Right, there's so many parallels. Exactly. What did you say, John? Sorry. Adam was given dominion, but it was usurped from him in Christ. Right. And, and he used it for, and he used it to our destruction. And Christ surrendered his dominion, and, and, and his obedience led to our, our redemption. And it's just, it's, it's really beautiful. You can do a series just on Adam. How was Jesus the true and better able? A little more obscure. Better sacrifice. Yeah, his sacrifice. Right? There's, there's sort of that connection, which is probably the one that jumps out quickly to us. Remember that phrase in Genesis 4 when 
God says to Cain, your brother's blood cries out from the ground for vengeance, right? There's blood of another one that cries out, not for, not for condemnation, or maybe it cries out for, uh, for redemption. redemption. Right, and there's a lot of, there's a unique parallel there as well. Um, hey, how is Jesus the true and better Abraham? He obeyed, he yeah. obeyed what God told him. He obeyed, sent, went, uh, and to establish a people for, for, for himself, for God. There's, there's, there's a lot of parallels there, uh, beautiful parallels really. Uh, do you guys have Isaac too? Yeah. How is Jesus the true and better Isaac? He submitted himself willingly as a sacrifice. Yeah, that's one of the greatest ones, isn't it? The, the beloved son, the firstborn. Um, he's sacrificed by his father. I mean, there's, there's, I, mean you could, I keep saying this, but there's this great, great parallel there. This might be a series oh, for an LC. Was that? But he was. Well, yeah, I didn't make the story of it so we don't get. So we go through the whole. Right, 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 right. right. We're going faster and skipping. God, God provided. Right. It wasn't that Isaac. Right. So Isaac would never have been an appropriate sacrifice. Right. God provided the lamb then, but Jesus is that way. Is the appropriate. Is that is that the sacrifice? Because that's what. Yeah. So that's why he's the true and better Isaac, because Isaac would not have been right. a, a, a sacrifice for sin. The connections symbolically were they offered up by his father. But he would never have been. That's a good point. But I, said, I don't really believe knew that Abraham knew. Because in the story of Jesus offered himself up to the point of death, I don't know if Isaac was saying, hey, yo, let's go. But he, right. just, he allowed himself to be bound and to be laid on the altar. Right. He did. Well, the right. point to keep in mind from that perspective is the fact that he just wasn't a kid. He was. Yeah, yeah. That, it's true. Right. We yeah. think of him as a little kid. Yeah. Yeah. He was no. at least a young adolescent, not a grown man. Yeah. Okay. Um, Joseph. How is Jesus the true and better Joseph? He saved his family. Yeah. He betrayed. Betrayed. He was falsely accused. He forgave others, his, his brethren. Freely forgave those, he, those that he would have justified in punishing. He was tested. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was salvation of his brother. Yeah. He, he, was, he was their instrument of salvation. Yeah. How was Jesus the true and better Moses? Uh, delivered his people. Yeah. He was an intercessor for his people. Uh, his ministry came later in life. John's like, wait, this, you got to be, we, we, bro, we forget. It's good. 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 Jesus crossed over there. Yeah. There's a bunch of He made it. Jesus made it in the promise line. Right. right. He, he did. He did. <laughs> the true and better, right? That's the whole point. It is, there are, there are both beautiful parallels where we see these things point to Christ, the things they did. There are also limitations in the Old Testament characters where they're imperfect, and we see that's why the true and better. Christ is the fulfillment of these things, both in their symbolism and their imperfections. Um, how is Jesus the true and better Job? That's a more obscure one. Job was highly tested. He was the righteous man who suffered. Yeah. And he was a new for his friend. That's the part, yeah. yeah. Remember that part of the end of Job? God, God seems to like he's like not happy with uh, Bildad the Shuhite, and uh, <laughs> he's gonna wipe him out. You know, smallest man in the Bible, by the way, Bildad the Shuhite. <laughs> Slightly shorter than Nehemiah. Okay, moving on before we get to really into that. Uh, how was Jesus the true better David? Shepherd. He was a man after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. He was chosen directly by God, uh, king of course, and uh, came from low beginnings. Yeah, absolutely. And he's, I mean, we know that of course he's, he's the ancestor, human speaking, of Christ, of the Messiah. His victory also becomes his people's victory. Like he, he, the people are, so, so one of the things that we, you know, I think the David Glad story, we think about, okay, um, don't, conquer your Goliaths. Be like David, and with God's help, conquer your Goliaths. Actually, perhaps a better application would be, you're like the Israelites, who are too chicken, they're, they're peeing their pants in the corner, and you need someone to go fight for you, because the enemy's too great. You need someone to stand in for you, to conquer the enemy of God and, and your own destruction, because you're not going to win this battle while you're on your camp. And it's an unlikely hero, by the way. You know, yeah. there's a lot of people who out there. We know where David's bones are. Yes, right. And Jesus. Peter says that in Acts 2, right? I'll tell you, his tombs right there, you can go see it. He saw 
saw the cave. The Lord said to my Lord, sit in my right hand until you can. Yeah, there's, I mean, again. Did you get excited about this? I remember reading that D.A. Carson wrote in the book. He said, people tend to get excited when their pastors get excited about it. I would, I, would, I would press that and say, well, their teachers get excited about it. So get excited about Jesus. Isn't that a great line? <laughs> people tend to get excited when their teachers get excited about it. So get excited about Jesus. Um, okay, how is Jesus the true and better Jonah? We already kind of covered that a little bit, but give us some good stuff. Three days two, verse three days in the end. Right? Yeah. Oh, well. Or Jonah shrunk away from the prophet. Jesus did not shrink away. Right. Jonah went as far away from God as he could get. He, he certainly did. And <laughs> Jonah being cast, but Jonah knew. Jonah being cast overboard was the what? The salvation of the ship. Right. And his, his plunging into the depths was, which is the Hebrew symbolism for like the, the abyss, far from God, was the salvation of those on board. And he knew that. Now he's no, I mean, he, he falls far short of the imperfection. Jesus is the true and better. And they were the Gentiles. Yeah, that's right. They're Gentile sailors. But as far from God as you can get. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great point. I should, I, I should write that down. Jesus is the true and better Boaz. And I went one way. Purchased us. God bought us back. And then last, or true and better, Nehemiah, I feel like we just finished the series of the servers. <laughs> Our leader, him to rebuild and restore. Yeah, yeah. Reconcile, and yeah. Restore. reconcile us, restore God's people, rebuild. That, I mean, that, that Ephesians is full of the imagery of, of walls and bricks and mortar and the temple being rebuilt. We are being joined together into a holy temple in which God dwells by His Spirit. That's Nehemiah's pointing to that in many ways. Okay, we can go on now. What's that? Well, Nehemiah had compassion and he left his kingdom. I mean, he was, I mean, the, the symbolism of Nehemiah being at the feet of the king in comfort, but he took on the compassion point of tears right. and left all of that to go to the people in the greatest need yeah. and provide what they. And what does the gospel say about Jesus when he saw the crowds? They were like, he like a sheep without a shepherd. He was, he was moved with compassion for the Jerusalem High Wall to gather him as a hen gathers for chicks. He says, right? Exactly. But he would not have it. Um, um, and unjust opposition. I mean, now let me make a point here. So, so as teachers, we don't just find ways in which Old Testament carols, characters did things that sort of symbolize what Jesus did suffered, you know, sacrificed, led. That's true. But there we find ways in which that, the, the context in which that character lived, the events of that story are pointing us to the fulfillment in Christ. So it's not just, oh yeah, Jesus was a leader too. Jesus cried too. It's not, that's not the point. The point is, we see symbolism in their, in their, in their life and in the context in which the, that story happens that's pointing us to its fulfillment. If we really believe that, that this is all about Jesus, he seems to say so himself. Going back to our first three verses. Trying to think on the position of the writer of Hebrews and the superiority of Christ is really what you're saying. You're yeah. Well, yeah, that, 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 we, what, what, Hebrews 5 through 9? Yeah. Essentially, how Jesus is superior? Right. Yeah. Um, that's, that, by, by the way, it's a good segue to number 5, which is titles. We won't have time to get into that because I want to get to the pitfalls and mistakes. But you find many titles that are repeated in both Testaments, and there's a few of them for you there. Some of them are obvious, and, and we, it's fun to point them out. Some require more study to make the connection of the Son of Man and Daniel. And Jesus seems, that seems to be his favorite phrase by himself, and it shows in Revelation 2, it's sort of like, what does that mean? There's a lot in there. Some are really beautiful, and they're like light, and unpacking that throughout Scripture like, as an imagery. And how some of these symbols, you find that they're not just, they're not just pointing to God's Word, uh, the, the text, but like, they're pointing to the Word incarnate. Uh, anyway, we, we'll stop on that because there's not time for the last page. Pitfalls and problems, I'll just, we'll just talk with these briefly and we'll be done because we're over time already. Um, these are problems both with failing to point to Christ appropriately in our teaching and with um, perhaps forcing it, uh, in, circumventing this process, if you will. Um, I keep using the phrase moralism. What's a good definition for moralism? Anybody? Uh, 
Look at me, two shoes. <laughs> yeah. I think you could say it's our form of reductionism. Reducing the story or, or, or passage of scripture to a moral lesson, a soft stable kind of thing, right? There's a, there's a moral of the story. Uh, uh, what, was the, what was the phrase, Jenny, in that video that by Tullian that, um, that Kathleen Keller used. Therapeutic moralist. No, no, that's Christian. That's Christian. Yeah. Um, um, oh, Mott. Oh. Mott's preaching. Mm -hmm. M-O-T-S. Yeah. He says, the moral of the story. Oh, yeah. preaching. He says, I think most preachers in America today are addicted to Mott's preaching. And he said, he went, Mott's? Did she say Mott's? What did she say? What does that mean? I didn't know what that meant. It's a little phrase. She's moral of the story of preaching. Because we're application of it. Our, our, our culture is. Okay, what do I have to do? Give me the, boil it down for me. Give me the, the three bullet points, the, the tangible takeaways. And I, I, I believe in application. I think, well, I think ultimately the Holy Spirit is the applier of the text. Ultimately, we, we, he might use us to do that. But there's a reductionism that happens when it's like, there's a moral here, here's the moral in this way. That leads to, a, that's a dead religion. The problem with moralism is, I think moralism is completely anti-Christian, actually. If it's, not, let me qualify that, it's not anti-Christian to point out morality in Scripture, or immorality in Scripture, and call people to a holy life, that's not anti-Christian. But a devoid of the gospel, it's not, it's not undergirded with the gospel, it's, it's lead to death, Paul says. Not to life, it's not helping people. Keep you out of perplexity with your face. No, no, okay. I'm not right so in other words, be David, yeah. don't be Saul. That's really no, no, no power to change somebody's life. You want to, you want not to. I think people walk around with a general sense of that, even if they're not talking about it or trying to bury it. It's, it's in us. We know we ought to be better than we are. And calling out of somebody, there has to be an answer. That answer is Christ, and, all, and we have to point to him in Scripture. Um, okay. Forcing interpretation. I mentioned allegory. It's a classic example of this. Um, so, okay, I have on my shelf the uh, uh, Nicene and Anti-Nicene Fathers. You can get it now for a lot less money on your, on your Kindle. But I have books because I like the Daniel Space. They look, they look serious. <laughs> so any, any bibliophiles in here with me, with like actual books, or all you guys all can check out. Anyway, when you, I'm going to give you an example from one of the early church fathers, Origen. Uh, of, of, a, of an allegorical interpretation of 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 10. Uh, turn there with me, if you will. Origen mentioned the scripture, by the way. <laughs> That's not a type of Christ. Yeah. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 10. Well, we'll read 8 through 10. <clears throat> One day, Elisha went on to Shunem where a wealthy woman lived, who urged him to eat some food. <coughs> so whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold, now I know there is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls, and put there a bed for, for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp, so whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. Just that's the text, okay? Elisha passes by, stops at for dinner, she's apparently a good cook. Whenever he's in town, he has a meal. She thinks it's cool that a guy and a guy stop by. Let's put him in a little room. And she mentions these furnishings. Origin, you know where I'm going with this? Origin takes the table, the chair, and the lamp and makes those, the, the crux of this teaching, and the lamp symbolizes. The lamp is allegorical for the prophet's need for divine light. 17 pages on the lamp. That was in Kings 4, verse 10. And the lamp. I think, I, I think that the writer of St. Kings is simply saying there was a lamp in the room. You know, a little all that. That's all they're saying is the room had a lamp. I don't think, you know, I don't think it's, a, it's pointing to any for divine light and to be a true prophet. I don't think it's not a type of Christ. I think it just happens to be. That, yeah. Isn't that the name of our new service? Word, table, and lamp? <laughs> <laughs> Word, table, and chair. <laughs> well played, sir. <laughs> So anyway, now, do prophets need divine illumination? Yes. But that's not the meaning of the text. That's simply a historical reference, right? So anyway, that's an example of my forcing interpretation, extreme example. Disconnected stories. Now, this is not a mistake that teachers necessarily tend to make, but I think we have a whole bunch of people in the church today 
who view the Bible, if they or read it, or if they think about it at all, as a bunch of disconnected stories. They know that an axe had floated. They know that a donkey talked. They know that, uh, that there was uh, that the stairway went to heaven. They know that the Red Sea parted. They know that there were the smoke and fire, smoke by, you know, cloud by day and fire by night. They, but they don't know, have any sense for how this comes together. And what that leads to, I think, is dismissiveness or skepticism. Crazy, weird, fantastic mythologies that are disconnected, interesting for kids, and we can extract some more lessons out of them, but they're not part of the narrative suite. When, you, when we start to bring this into those crazy, weird, fantastic stories, people stop asking the question, that can't be true, and they start uh, going, that, like, oh, I see what that means now. I see what that means now. Now, I believe that it is true, and we should point that teaching, but what I'm saying, when they're disconnected, it only breeds the disbelief and the and the, the skepticism and the dismissiveness, I think, toward the stories, because we're not telling them how this, what this means. We're just saying, ah, this story is about something it's not about. Okay. Uh, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, I talk about, uh huh, uh huh, theology. Sometimes you're preaching to them, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. So anyway, finally missing the point. It's entirely possible, in fact, common, sadly for people to know, know the stories of the Bible, to spend time reading the Bible, to quote the Bible, even to have memorized large chunks of the Bible, even, shockingly, to teach the Bible, and totally miss the point of the Bible. It was true in Jesus' day, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and the scribes, it's true in our churches today. I don't want it to be true about us. I don't think it is, but we need to be guard against it. Um, well, it's a verse here, but we're over time, so we'll stop. Anyway, I, I want to encourage you with this. I, I, I gave away the last line already uh, from D.A. Carson. People tend to get excited about their teachers are excited about it. So get, let's get excited about Jesus. Whatever you're teaching, get on your knees and ask God to open your eyes. Uh, Colossians 3.16, that the word of Christ will dwell in you richly. You're not going to be able to point him out in here unless he resides in here. You know, And, um, and that, that, that's the best thing we can do. People sometimes will say, I want deeper teaching. And so I think there's like different categories of what they mean by that, you know. I, I mean deeper teaching in our church. Most people mean, I want to hear stuff I haven't heard before. You know? Well, I'm not sure that's deeper. I'm not sure that's even healthy. Because a lot of it's already been said multiple, multiple times, you know. Um, or I want historical context to mean by deeper. That can be helpful to interpret it. That can be fascinating, interesting. I love it. But I think truly deeper teaching is two things. It's taking seriously in, the, in my, my life what I know to be true in the Word of God, and it's pointing people to Christ. Those things put together, right? That's deeper teaching. That's what we're calling it. So, um, here ended the lesson. <laughs> and uh, I think we have announcements about what's next for our group.